Welcome to this special edition of Political Jungle, Race to the Bench. This spring, it appears that approximately 40, no less than 40 esteemed members of the bar will be vying to become the nominees for a handful of vacant seats on the Court of Common Pleas alone. Because COVID-19 has made hand-to-hand -hand combat lethal and in the minds of many unpatriotic, the customary methods of campaigning, in particular meeting voters face-to-face, has been cast aside. So as a service to our loyal political jungle viewers and to voters throughout the Commonwealth, PCTV will bring as many candidates as possible into the political jungle. Today, we're bringing Zeke Redeker. We hope that this more intimate conversation will enable those filling out their ballots to evaluate the character and suitability of those seeking to be addressed your honor. All right, great. Zeke Redeker, welcome to the political jungle. Thank you, Steve. Happy to be here. Uh, I have watched so many episodes of the political jungle over the years that uh, the fact that I get to be on here with you today is a great honor for me. Great, great. Well, welcome to the Surf and Safari. We're going to have some fun today. Uh, and, you know, Zeke, I've, I've had the pleasure of knowing you for a very, very long time, but uh, I want to make sure that the rest of uh, Allegheny County gets to know you uh, intimately. So why don't we start and uh, and why don't you tell folks why you're running for judge? I'm running for judge because I, I really care about the issues. Um, I'm passionate about criminal justice reform and fair housing. Um, I've done a lot of pro bono work in both of those areas. I'm a community advocate uh, here in Pittsburgh. I'm a graduate of the Pittsburgh Public Schools. I'm an attorney at Reed Smith. I'm a former uh, federal court clerk, both in New York City and in Detroit. Um, and I honestly, Steve, I'm, I'm, I'm running because I'm passionate about my hometown of Pittsburgh. I'm passionate about the judiciary and I'm passionate about equal justice for all people, which is something that I think we really need in our country right now. That's fantastic. Uh, let's, you just answered probably my first seven questions. But, uh, <laughs> let's, let's go with number one. So you, you were born uh, and went to school in the Pittsburgh Public Schools, correct? I did, yes. And interestingly, uh, um, you ended up being bused to school by, you opted to be bused to school. Tell us about that. Yeah. So uh, my parents made the decision when I was in first grade to send me to East Hills Elementary, uh, which the school is closed now, but at the time it was one of the best elementary schools in the city. It was part of the magnet program along with other schools like Liberty and Linden uh, that helped to integrate Pittsburgh public in the wake of the civil rights movement. Uh, so I grew up with kids from all kinds of different backgrounds. And my parents tell a story um, about uh, visiting the lunchroom for the first time at East Hills and walking in there and seeing kids of all kinds of different backgrounds from all over the city. Um, there was a slightly unruly quality to the lunchroom, um, but there was a lot of love in there. And my mom saw that and she said, that's what I want for my kid. And I'm, I'm so glad that she did that because having the chance to grow up with kids, especially kids from the community of East Hills, um, was an amazing experience. And, you know, later on in life, I think that we really get divided by the kind of barriers of race and class that come along uh, later uh, in life. But as kids, I think we were able to really connect with each other in a way that was really special and that represented true diversity. Well, you were a real, you were a minority in, in your elementary school. It's true. Right? And it was one of the best in elementary schools, but uh, people did not send their kids there. Well, why do you think that that was the case? And what do you think you, know, you learned um, as, as a result of being in that situation? It's interesting to watch the arc of, of East Hills. I actually uh, spoke with um, a guy this morning, you probably know him, E.J. Strasburger. Mm -hmm. um, and he told me that he camped out overnight at East Hills, literally slept there to get his kids into that school, okay? And there were a lot of parents who did that because they believed deeply uh, in integrated schools and in, pub, you know, in, in city public education. Um, you know, East Hills had a wonderful run. We had this great principal named Mr. Nicholas who brought together kids of all kinds of different backgrounds and really was a, um, a major force in public education. Um, over the years, uh, we saw uh, slowly the resegregation of Pittsburgh public schools. 
And this was something that really bothered me. When East Hills closed in 2008, I wrote an op-ed to the uh, Pittsburgh Post-Gazette lamenting that, that what we were seeing in these schools, which really was um, partly a realization of Martin Luther King Jr.'s dream, you know, to have people of all uh, colors and creeds come together and, and learn together was something that uh, was becoming less common in Pittsburgh. So, um, you know, I think that was a really formative experience for me. And I've stayed involved with the East Hills community um, for, for many years now. Um, I've worked with State Representative Ed Ganey to create what we call the East Hills Back to School Drive. Um, we've partnered with Adidas and uh, we have a big cookout in East Hills where we work with community leaders there and a lot of folks in the community to distribute backpacks to families. Um, and it's a really wonderful thing. And, and uh, for me, on a, on a very deep level, uh, is, is very meaningful. And then, uh, so you went on there to, went from there to uh, Alderdice High School. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I would, my daughter would give me a hard time if I didn't mention the fact that you and she were on the <laughs> national winning uh, history quiz team, right? That's I mean, right. So. Academic World Quest 2005. That's, yeah. that's still happening these days? It I is. And it's that. gotten a lot bigger, actually. It's become a like a really like big, like, you know, like enormous national competition. It was big when we did it, but it has only grown in size and scope. They give away like enormous scholarships to kids who win it uh, now. Of course, miss that one too. So, yeah. uh, well, they stand on the sh shoulders of giants. What can we say? <laughs> and from there to Cornell, right? Yeah, that's right. Good red. Okay. Um, and what did you study at Cornell? I, uh, I did African history. Um, so I was a part of what was called the College Scholar Program. And I studied comparative colonialism in Africa and Latin America. And I actually had a chance to go on a program with my parents called Semester at Sea back in 2001. Um, when it used to be anchored, uh, pun intended, at Pitt. Um, but it's a, it, they take a cruise ship and they take six, 700 college students and a faculty of professors and put them on there. And it travels around the world as a floating university. And I had the opportunity to go to both South Africa and Kenya, uh, which was a wonderful experience. But at 13 years old is a real eye opener because you see some of the problems that those societies face, especially South Africa, you know, post-apartheid South Africa. Mm -hmm. um, and it was something that I really wanted to study and understand. So I did African-American and African uh, studies at Cornell. So were you, you the only uh, student on the boat with mom and dad? Uh, oh, no, boat? no, no. They were a bunch. Yeah, they, yeah, they called us the dependents. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. Well, uh, uh, okay. So from Cornell, did you, did you go straight to law school? I didn't. Um, my interest in African history actually carried me over uh, across the pond. So um, I was fortunate to get a full scholarship to attend the University of Oxford in England. Um, and I spent uh, some time doing a master's degree in African studies, thinking that maybe I wanted to do a PhD in African history. Um, and that was a phenomenal experience. But I ended up getting interested in politics. And I ended up going to law school at Michigan, where I met my wife. And so very, very much worth it, at least from that, from that regard. It was all meant to be. So really, I mean, you were summa cum laude from, uh, from Cornell and your, your, your parents are, your dad's an academic. Uh, where did the law, lawyer thing come from? Uh, yeah, I think, I think I wanted to, I wanted, I was interested in politics and I wanted to do something that I felt like was going to be uh, practical, um, that would give me a practical training in um, a specific field. I wanted to learn a discipline. Um, and so I went to law school and the first summer uh, after um, I was in law school, I worked for a federal judge named Jeb Boesberg in DC. And um, it was a wonderful experience. I'm still in touch with him to this day, but I got to watch from beginning to end the trial of Roger Clemens. Oh, um, fantastic. Yeah. yeah, for lying to Congress about uh, about his alleged doping. And he he was a he was um, acquitted uh, in that trial. And I remember standing on the courthouse steps. I was just coming out of the courthouse and there were just throngs of media everywhere. And I'm walking out and all of a sudden I see all these camera guys going, get out of the way. Right. And I turn around and Roger Clemens is right behind me and I'm messing up NBC's shot, you know, or something like that. So got out of the way, 
watch this press conference. But from there, sort of litigation, especially litigation in federal courts, kind of hooked me. And that's where my career has ended up, has ended up going. That's great. Um, and I apologize to uh, our Political Jungle viewers whenever you hear a dog barking. This is Political Jungle Virtual Edition. <laughs> There's a lot going on in everyone's home. So thanks for your indulgence. Uh, how about, we're, let's move on to show and tell. Did you bring something for show and tell today, Z? I did. And it actually circles back to the story that I told you just a few minutes ago and how important East Hills Elementary is to me. This uh -huh. is a t-shirt from East Hills. And you can see that it's probably a little bit small for me now. Um, but you can see East Hills was a French magnet school. Um, it, uh, it's an, it was, says International Studies Academy. It has the Eiffel Tower on there. And, um, you know, I remember doing, you know, lessons at East Hills where they were teaching us about French speaking West Africa, for example, right? You know, learning all this stuff as a young kid and uh, kids from all kinds of different backgrounds uh, participating in this international studies program, which was just a wonderful program. And, and for me, I really think that, um, you know, I'm running for judge on the Court of Common Pleas, but my experience at East Hills has led me to be a community advocate. And the community work that I've done has grown into two passions of mine, criminal justice reform and fair housing. And all of those reasons together, and, and knowing that we have nine seats open on the Court of Common Pleas this spring, um, really made me want to run for judge to uh, improve the uh, administration of justice in Allegheny County. We have a generational chance to do that in this election. So from from Paris to Pittsburgh, from Paris, from to, Paris to Pittsburgh, from from Squirrel Hill to East Hills. Um, yeah. That's a, a big part of my story. Excellent. Thanks for sharing that. Let's move to the deep dive. You know, the deep dive portion of the show where we find out what gets you up in the morning, what motivates you, who inspires yep. you. What makes you sweat, et cetera, and what you want to be when you grow up. So okay. who is your inspiration? You know, uh, that's that's a good question. Are you is the is the question geared toward a uh, specific person or well, um well, you know, you, you've clerked for a couple of judges. Um, yep. you're, you're going, you're seeking to become a judge. That's yep. probably the what you'll do the rest of your career. Right. Uh, is are there judges in particular who have inspired you to do that? What was your role model? Absolutely, yes. Um, I would say, you know, I already mentioned one, Jeb Bosberg in DC, uh, an amazing judge, um, really was my first, the first judge that I worked for. Um, another judge, uh, another federal judge who's on the US District Court in uh, Michigan, the Eastern District of Michigan, named Judy Levy. And um, Judge Levy really was one of the main reasons why I was able to get the federal clerkships that I was able to get. I, I got to know Judge Levy because she taught a class on policing and public safety. When she was a federal prosecutor, she was embedded in the Detroit Police Department uh, for years under a consent decree and just had these incredible experiences trying to reform the Detroit Police Department. Um, I ended up doing a year-long study with Judge Levy on gang violence and policing in Detroit, Cleveland, and Pittsburgh. Um, I was uh, got a, a fellowship called the Race, Law, and History Fellowship in Michigan, and I was able to interview gang members and cops and federal prosecutors and uh, politicians and social service providers to really understand what was going on with gang violence in our cities and how police responses um, uh, were both adequate and inadequate in addressing violence, how social service responses um, could reach young people who are at risk of committing violent acts through gangs um, or, or at risk for getting involved in, in, the, um, in the drug trade. Uh, and that was a wonderful project that I got to work on with Judge Levy. She ended up marrying us, my wife Greer and I. Uh, you know, uh, when we got married. Um, so we were very close. And she ended up introducing me to uh, the judge in the federal judge in New York City that I ended up clerking for, Pamela Chen. Um, and oh, wow. uh, working for Judge Chen was an amazing experience. We had one of the biggest trials in the country uh, that year, which was, you know, um, an intense experience for all of us. It was the Department of Justice's prosecution of FIFA, the International Soccer Organization for Corruption. 
which was a headline making trial. Um, lots going on. RICO is a complicated statute. It had international dimensions, which were issues of first impression, meaning they had never been litigated before. Um, and it, I had a wonderful experience in New York City with Judge Chen. And then the, the, uh, after that, I went and clerked for the Federal Court of Appeals in Detroit for um, Judge Helene White. And again, um, appellate courts are very different than trial courts, but I helped adjudicate the civil rights case that it was brought against the county clerk in Kentucky who refused to issue marriage licenses to gay couples in the wake of Obergefell, which legalized same-sex marriage. So I've been blessed to what was have the decision a, there. See, what, what was the what? What did you decide there? What did the yeah? Judge so it, uh, the case uh, revolved around sovereign and qualified immunity, um, and the court ended up holding her. The court ended up ruling that the case against her could go forward. It was a, a 1983 case, um, okay. which is a major civil rights statute. So let's talk about what gets you up in the morning. And obviously there's a new member of your household. That's one of the things that gets you yeah, up in the morning, right? right? Yeah, sure. Can you share that uh, with everybody? Yeah, so uh, we have a 12 week old daughter named Leona. Um, she's uh, wonderful. Um, she's the light of our lives, even if she does, as you said, Steve, get us up in the morning or keep us up at night. Um, right. You know, some days I wake up in the morning and I think, man, I've got a newborn and I'm running my first political campaign. Wow, that's a lot, right? And then other days, most days I wake up in the morning and I think, wow, I've got a newborn and I'm running my first political campaign. I'm living my dream right now, oh, you know? Yeah. So, um, so Leona certainly gets us up in the morning. Uh, she's wonderful. We named her after my grandfather. Um, uh, the tradition is that, you know, our, my grandfather's name was Lawrence, so we wanted an L name, and we ended up naming her Leona, which means lioness, and we're uh, very hopeful that she will grow up to be fierce, just like her namesake. That's beautiful. Uh, so motivation, perspiration, what keeps you, what keeps you up at night? Uh, certainly uh, the fact that you're all of a sudden doing all of these things at once and running a political campaign. Let me ask you a question. How yeah. do you feel about this? You, you, you work for two federal judges, but you're running for a state court position. Yep. Uh, yep. You can't run for a federal court, but uh, does, do you think that judges should, be, should uh, run for office or do you think they ought to be appointed like they are in the federal system? I think um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really good debate. Uh, on the one hand, I am in favor of democracy uh, and people choosing their leaders, but in, in practice, it doesn't really work that way in state court because people run once, they have no record as, as a judge, and then they're subject to retention votes every 10 years. So it's not exactly a, um, it's not exactly a system where voters are, are conscious of the kind of decisions that judges are making and choose whether or not to retain them. Um, I think our, our system might actually do better with appointments. Um, you know, I think well, it's too that, late. Uh, you're running. <laughs> what's that? It's yeah, too right. late. You're exactly. already running. Right. right, right. No, I'm part of the reason I'm running is because I think that uh, in the Democratic Party, um, there's not a pathway, uh, a clear pathway for younger lawyers who are interested in judicial careers. You know, um, in the Republican Party, you know, you look at the Federalist Society, you look at all of the ways that they've organized to get younger and um, you know, uh, good lawyer, young, good younger lawyers on the bench. Um, we don't have that in the Democratic Party. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, part of the reason that I'm running, you know, I'm 33 years old. I really want to uh, be able to show people that, you know, um, if you have good quality legal experience, but you don't necessarily have a, you know, a ton of gray hair, um, even though I've got a little bit, you know, you can, you can still run for office. Um, you can still run to be a judge. And um, I, to be quite frank with you, Steve, I think we need new, new blood on the bench in Allegheny County. We can do better. Great. Thanks for that very honest, honest answer, honest response. And uh, last aspiration, what do you want to be when you grow up? Obviously, can I tell you one more perspiration story? You can tell you got one, one more perspiration, but then you lose aspiration. No, go ahead. Fire away. <laughs> um, really what keeps me up at night uh, you know, other than, you know, uh, wondering how this political campaign is actually going is um, the issues that the city of Pittsburgh faces. Uh, and one of those big issues is criminal justice reform. Um, 
I worked on a case uh, that got referred to us by a nonprofit organization started by two rappers, Jay-Z and Meek Mill, that advocates for nationwide criminal justice reform. And it involved a man who about five years ago had been charged with assault. Mm -hmm. And he had no previous criminal record and he um, disputed the circumstances. So unlike a lot of criminal defendants, he took the case to trial. And right before the jury was about to deliberate, the prosecutor approached him and said, look, if you agree to plead guilty to assault, we will advocate for you to get a probationary sentence. So, you know, what do you think he did? He took the deal. He went home to his family. Two years later, the prosecutor hauls him back into court, alleging that he's violating the terms of his probation. The only problem, Steve, is that his probation officer never bothers to show up to the hearing. So, um, you know, there was no admissible evidence that he was actually violating his probation. That doesn't stop the judge on the court of common pleas from not only revoking his probation, but giving him five to 10 years in state prison, okay? Our client sat in prison for three years before we got this case. And we came on and we filed our habeas motions, which is a very complicated area of the law. We had a series of hearings in front of a new judge and um, we put hundreds of hours in this case. And, and, and when it was the prosecution's turn to respond, they shrugged their shoulders and they said, you know what, we're not even gonna file a response, you guys are right. Right, after he spent three years in jail. Exactly. And Steve, we had this incredible moment where we knew we had just won our case and we knew how hard it was to win these cases. Yeah. But we were thinking, if we're right, why has our client been sitting in prison for three years? Yeah. Okay. We walked this guy out of prison and sent him home to his family, which was wonderful, but all the while knowing that he would never get those three years of his life back. Well, you know, you have a, you did that at your law firm, uh, which allowed you to do that on a pro bono basis, which uh, really kudos to Reed Smith for giving you that opportunity. Yeah, but well, that's what keeps me up at night, you know, well, knowing that there's so many people in the system, just like the client that we represented, who probably should not be in prison right now. I hate to go from such a serious subject. <laughs> no, hey, all good. To the happy hour rapid response, which we're going to yeah. call the nine. Um, yeah. And the nine, of course, refers either to the Supreme Court of the United States, the nine, or the nine openings on the Court of Common Pleas. It's up to you to decide. Love that. Um, all right, here we go. One, bears or wolverines? Wolverines. Well, you know that the bears, the bears were, uh, were the mascot. You think it was the mascot for Cornell, right? And the yeah. wolverines obviously are Michigan. And yeah. they shouldn't play football against each other. No, but they you know, shouldn't. <laughs> you know that the bear, there really is no mascot of Cornell. It's the, the it's the big red. The big red, yeah. The bear, they use a bear. That's the mascot, but there's no official right. mascot. All right, yeah. diapers, cloth or disposable? Disposable. And I trust my wife, you know, she, she get, even though we use disposable, she's got a whole program of organic biodegradable, you know, um, I think we're using some pretty good diapers, but I know that we throw them away. Okay. Well, you know, as the former chair of uh, Sustainable Pittsburgh, I'm going to have to report you. No, it's, it's <laughs> all good. All right. Number three, good night moon or no, my first book of protest. Ooh, both good. Um, I am going to go with good night moon just because I grew up on good night moon. Um, and I know what a wonderful book it is, but we have a whole shelf full of books, um, like uh, the book of protest upstairs. We got one about Ruth Bader Ginsburg. We've got one about feminist heroes. Um, so she's going to she's going to undoubtedly end up getting both. So, yeah. So our readership knows it's not for her to read in five or 10 or 15 years. These are children's books that are very popular right now. Yes. Uh, and I'm sure you got them as gifts. All right. Number five uh, for Magna Carta or Magnet Charter? Mm. I got to go with Magna Carta. Having uh, spent time in Oxford, right, in England, I, yep. I want to give you that option. And uh, yeah. <laughs> right. But you're, you went to a magnet school. I did. East Hills was a magnet school. It was. Okay. It was. Um, and the two really are related. You know what I mean? It's, uh, I've carried my East Hills experience with me for many years. And it probably, you know, trying to understand major issues of race and socioeconomic inequality is a major reason that I ended up uh, doing a master's degree in African studies at Oxford. 
Steelers or steel workers? That's a hard one. Yeah, um, I, I worked at the steel workers, as I'm sure you know, um, and I'm proud of that. And I've got a real, you know, I, with the amount of labor support that we've been able to get in this campaign, you know, because uh, we've got seven official unions endorsing us, um, makes me want to say steel workers, but I am a diehard Steelers fan and, uh, you know, probably more obsessive than even your average Pittsburgher. So that's a tough, that really is a tough one. Got to um, choose, got to choose. This is what you being a judge is all about, Tom. Steelworkers. All right, there we go. Uh, four more, trials or appeals? Ooh, another tough one, trials. Good answer since you're running for the trial court. Right. right. Um, I love appeals though. You know, appeals are, uh, you know, I really love the critical thinking and issue analysis involved in appeals, mm -hmm. but trials, that, that's really where my heart is. You know, I mean, this is the first line of the court system um, being able to, uh, you know, watch a lot of amazing trials, adjudicate a lot of amazing, amazing trials, try cases over the years um, has been a wonderful experience. And I hope to continue that in my run for judge on the Court of Common Pleas. All right. Now, this is this is not fair because we only have a minute left and I, I need quick answers on these last three. And I know okay. there's a lot more to talk about, but maybe people will meet you on the trail. Yep. Hopefully with COVID. Here we go. Landlord or tenant? Can't I, you know, honestly, Steve, I can't pick one of this those. Is a trick question. I get yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I have done eviction defense in the past, but as a judge, I would promise I'd have to promise to be fair to both parties. Reasonable doubt or music to get murdered by? Uh, reasonable doubt. Now, of course, for Good our question. viewership who may not be in tune, reasonable yeah. doubt was by whose Jay -Z. album? Jay Z. Your Jay Z's one. first album, iconic. Great question. One of my favorite albums of all time. Music to get murdered by was by. Do you know? I, I actually that one is unfamiliar to me. Ah, Eminem. Oh, okay. That must have been a later one then, because um, you know I. Uh, you know, I'm, a, I'm an Eminem fan, but not like I'm a Jay-Z fan. So I stick with my original answer. All right. For a Squirrel Hill boy, here's the last one. You're going out on Best Day Ever or Blue Slide Park? Best Day Ever. Here's to Mac Miller. All right. Yeah. You know, both of them, uh, great pieces of music, but Best Day Ever. I don't know if you've ever seen the music video. It was shot in Whiteman Park. Uh, we have a brand new Whiteman Park. Uh, I live just a couple of blocks from there. We take our daughter there all the time. A um, lot of love for Blue Slide Park too, but I'm going with the, uh, the answer that it's a, that's uh, literally and figuratively a little closer to home. See, you survived the, the political jungle, my friend. Thank Thanks you. So Thanks hey, for it's, coming it's in. It's such a pleasure for me to, to have done this, Steve. I just, this is such a blast for me. Uh, for, for us too. We'll, uh, we'll see you on the campaign trail. Thanks for watching. Absolutely. Talk to you soon.